I believe that as evolutionists have increasingly realized how complex life is, they have realized that they need more time for that newly discovered complexity to evolve. And so they'll look for a dating technique that will give them that time they need, and they'll forget the vast majority of the scientific dating techniques that point to a young Earth. This notion that the age of the Earth is determined by biologists trying to make time for evolution is very popular amongst creationists. It's also patently absurd. Take a look at this paper by Claire Patterson from January 1956. It gives the age of the Earth as 4.55 billion years, almost exactly the same age as reported by scientists today. This means that the scientifically determined age of the Earth has not changed in 57 years. But virtually all of the complexity of life was discovered after 1956. So how can anyone in their right mind say that scientists used the complexity of life to determine the age of the Earth? The scientifically determined age of the Earth did not increase when the genetic code was unraveled, or when introns, exons, spliceosomes, and alternative splicing were discovered, or when riboswitches and ribozymes were discovered, or even when the human genome was sequenced. It's blatantly obvious that the complexity of life has nothing to do with the scientifically determined age of the Earth. But how do we know the age of the Earth? How did Claire Patterson come to the particular number of 4.55 billion years for the age of the Earth? Did he make it up? Did he get it from Satan? Was it voted on by a committee of evil geologists trying to undermine the Bible and destroy the gospel message? Of course not. To understand where this number came from, we need to understand something about atoms, elements, and isotopes. The world is made of atoms. Well, except for the 95% of the universe that's made out of dark matter and dark energy. Atoms consist of neutrons and protons in a compact nucleus surrounded by a swarm of electrons. All atoms belong to an element on the periodic table. Each element corresponds to the set of all atoms with a particular number of protons. For example, Hydrogen atoms have one proton, carbon atoms have six protons, oxygen atoms have eight protons, etc. Each element comes in different isotopes, each of which has a definite number of neutrons. Isotopes are named by giving the total number of neutrons and protons as a superscript, followed by the chemical symbol of the element that the isotope belongs to. For example, there are three isotopes of carbon that occur on Earth in significant amounts. All have six protons, but the number of neutrons they contain can be 6, 7, or 8. A carbon atom with 6 neutrons would be called carbon-12, because it has 6 protons plus 6 neutrons equals 12 neutrons and protons. Similarly, the isotope of carbon with 7 neutrons is called carbon-13, and the isotope with 8 neutrons is called carbon-14. Many nuclei are unstable, or radioactive, and spontaneously transform into more stable nuclei. For example, Carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable isotopes of carbon, but carbon-14 is unstable and decays into nitrogen-14. We say that carbon-14 is the parent nucleus and nitrogen-14 is the daughter nucleus. It is extremely important that we understand exactly how the number of unstable nuclei in a closed system decreases with time. In any given time period, there is some fraction of unstable nuclei that will decay. We usually give the time that it takes one half of the unstable nuclei to decay, the time which is called the half-life. For carbon-14, the half-life is 5,730 years. Let's do a thought experiment to make sure that we understand the concept of half-life. Consider a sample of 1,000 carbon-14 atoms. After one half-life, or 5,730 years, there will only be 500 carbon-14 atoms left. After two half-lives, or 11,460 years, there will be 250 carbon-14 atoms left. After three half-lives, or 17,190 years, there will be 125 carbon-14 atoms left. In general, during any period of time lasting 5,730 years, one half of the carbon-14 nuclei present at the beginning of that time period will decay into nitrogen-14 nuclei. Carbon-14 is useless when trying to determine the age of the Earth due to its short half-life, but there are radioactive isotopes with much longer half-lives like uranium-235, uranium-238, rubidium-87, and potassium-40. Each of these can be used to determine the age of the Earth. Before we discuss how we can find the age of the Earth using radioactive isotopes, we need to understand how we can use them to date rocks. 
Creationists love to say that rocks don't come with tags telling you their age. Well, duh. Stars don't come with tags telling us their temperature. Extrasolar planets don't come with tags telling us their radii. And galaxies don't come with tags telling us their mass. But we have cataloged these properties for many stars, planets, and galaxies. So it shouldn't be surprising that we can determine the age of a rock, even though the rock doesn't come with a tag telling us its age. We simply need to find a physical process that allows us to distinguish old rocks from young rocks. The radioactive decay of unstable isotopes is exactly the physical process that we need. Radiometric dating is the term used to describe the use of radioactive isotopes to date objects. Radiometric dating is used to determine the age of igneous rocks, which are rocks that solidify for magma or lava. It works like this. When a rock solidifies, it contains radioactive nuclei. As time passes, some of the radioactive nuclei decay into their daughter nuclei. At any given time, the ratio of the number of daughter nuclei to parent nuclei in a rock depends on the initial ratio of those nuclei, the half-life of the parent nucleus, and the age of the rock. Creationists say that since we can't travel back in time to measure the number of daughter atoms present in the rock when it formed, there is no way to find the age of a rock from measurements of the current daughter to parent ratio. But there are easy ways to get around this problem. The simplest way to get around this problem is to use a radioactive isotope whose daughter atoms are not present when the rock forms. A good example of this is the potassium-argon dating technique. Potassium-40 is radioactive with a half-life of 1.248 billion years. It decays into calcium-40 89.1% of the time and into argon-40 10.9% of the time. Argon-40 is a noble gas that escapes lava or magma and thus is essentially not present when the rock solidifies. As time progresses, the potassium-40 nuclei decay into argon-40 and calcium-40. We can find the age of the rock by measuring the present ratio of argon-40 to potassium-40, making sure to take into account that only 10.9% of the decays of the potassium-40 were into argon-40. Okay, so it's easy to measure the age of a rock if the daughter elements are not present when it formed. But what if we don't know how many daughter atoms were present when the rock formed? For example, rubidium-87 decays into strontium-87 with a half-life of 48.8 billion years. When rocks form, they will have incorporated some strontium-87 so that the future ratio of strontium-87 to rubidium-87 depends both on the age of the rock and the initial ratio of these isotopes. It therefore seems hopeless to try to use these isotopes to date rocks, but there is a clever trick that makes it possible to date rocks with these isotopes. Strontium has another stable isotope, strontium-86, that is not the result of any radioactive decay. Thus, the number of strontium-86 atoms in a rock doesn't change with time, because no nuclei are decaying into it, and it is not decaying into any other nuclei. Since strontium-86 and strontium-87 are isotopes of the same chemical element, all minerals must incorporate them with the same ratio when a rock first solidifies. So the initial ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86 is the same in every location of the rock. But rubidium and strontium are different elements, so each mineral can incorporate them in a different ratio. Thus the initial ratio of rubidium-87 to strontium-86 will vary throughout the rock. As a concrete example, suppose that an igneous rock has formed and contains three minerals. Each mineral has 1,000 atoms of strontium-87 and strontium-86. This satisfies the requirement that the initial ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86 is the same in all minerals. In my example, this ratio is 1. Now suppose that one of the minerals incorporated 1,000 rubidium-87 atoms, another mineral incorporated 2,000 rubidium-87 atoms, and the third mineral incorporated 3,000 rubidium-87 atoms. So the initial ratio of rubidium-87 to strontium-86 is different in each mineral. Let's visit the rock 1 billion years after it formed. Some of the rubidium-87 atoms in each of the minerals has decayed into strontium-87 atoms. The most important thing to note, however, is that the ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86 is no longer uniform throughout the rock. It is higher in those minerals that started with a higher ratio of rubidium-87 to strontium-86. After 2 billion years, even more rubidium-87 atoms have decayed into strontium-87 atoms, and the ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86 
becomes even more non-uniform. As more and more time advances, the ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86 becomes more and more non-uniform. This is the key to radiometric dating. The older a rock is, the more the ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86 will vary throughout the rock. This ratio will be the same throughout the rock when it forms, and it will become more and more non-uniform with time. It turns out that we can determine the exact age of the rock by measuring two quantities in different minerals of the same rock, or different rocks of the same age. These two quantities are the ratios of strontium-87 to strontium-86 and rubidium-87 to strontium-86. If we plot the measurements in a graph with strontium-87 to strontium-86 on the vertical axis and rubidium-87 to strontium-86 on the horizontal axis, they will lie on a straight line. When the rock first formed, the data points lie on a horizontal line because all minerals have the same ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86. As time advances, the minerals with a larger initial ratio of rubidium-87 to strontium-86 will have a larger ratio of strontium-87 to strontium-86. But, and this is the most important point, at any given time, all of the data points will lie on a straight line whose slope is determined by the age of the rock and the half-life of rubidium-87. The slope starts at zero when the rock first forms, and then increases as the rubidium-87 in each mineral decays into strontium-87. All you have to do to find the age of the rock is measure the slope of the line that the data points lie on, look up the half-life of rubidium-87, and plug these two numbers into a simple formula. You never had to know the initial ratio of strontium-87 atoms in the rock. Because the Earth is geologically active, none of the rocks on Earth have survived unchanged since the formation of the Earth but some meteorites have, and we can find the age of the solar system by radiometrically dating these fossil meteorites. Remember that I said that we can only use radiometric dating to get the age of igneous rocks. So when we date meteorites with these techniques, we get the time since they last solidified out of the solar nebula. The age of the Earth will be a few tens of millions of years younger than the age of meteorites because of the time that it took to assemble the Earth from the solid material that was condensing out of the protoplanetary disk that surrounded the developing sun. The method that Patterson used in his 1956 paper relied on the fact that uranium-235 and uranium-238 are both radioactive and decay into lead isotopes. Uranium-235 decays into lead-207 with a half-life of 704 million years, while uranium-238 decays into lead-206 with a half-life of 4.468 billion years. Lead-204 is a stable isotope of lead that is not the result of any radioactive decay. So, in any given meteorite, the number of uranium-235 and uranium-238 atoms will decrease with time, the number of lead-207 and lead-206 atoms will increase with time, and the number of lead-204 atoms will remain constant. Patterson plotted the lead-206 to lead-204 and lead-207 to lead-204 ratios in five different meteorites on a graph with lead-207 to lead-204 on the vertical axis and lead-206 to lead-204 on the horizontal axis. The data points lie on a straight line and one can show mathematically that the slope of the line depends on the age of the meteorites, the half-lives of uranium-235 and uranium-238, and the current ratio of uranium-235 to uranium-238. Using the measured data, he was able to show that the age of the meteorites must be 4.55 billion years. There are other isotopes that can be used to date meteorites. They all give a date around 4.55 billion years. So, in summary, the age of the Earth, as quoted by geoscientists, has nothing to do with the complexity of life discovered by biologists. We know this for two reasons. First, almost all of the complexity of life was discovered after 1956, during a time in which the Earth's scientifically determined age has not changed much from 4.55 billion years. Second, we know how geoscientists calculate the age of the Earth. They do this by measuring isotope ratios in meteorites, which obviously has nothing to do with the complexity of life. Further, it doesn't matter what isotopes they use. The age of the solar system always comes out to around 4.55 billion years.